Well, thank you everybody for coming. I'm Loretta Yarlow, director of the UMCA. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to have you here. Um, the one, several missing people, but the key missing person is uh, the artist, uh, Elisa Attila, uh, couldn't come to join us uh, here. Due to a conflict in her schedule, she has a major opening uh, in Stockholm at the Moderna Merzit. Um, and so, Lucky for her, a little sad for us that she's not here, but this is a, a, a retrospective of her, of her work. So that's where she's been. Uh, as you know, at our openings, we always have the artist present to uh, meet with the public and then to talk a bit about the art. So in place of the artist, we have <coughs> three wonderful, distinguished people from the five college faculty here to talk about the work. Um, Fraser Stables, Jay Garfield, Monique Krolofs to um, really give impromptu impressions and thoughts and how it relates to their own work, practice, and scholarship uh, about a work that is um, so rich in iconography, symbols, associations, interpretations, uh, a work that's so rich in, um, in really a kind of a, a searching and a questioning that um, many people find pretty compelling and riveting uh, and exciting to, to have these, these kinds of questions uh, out there that, um, that is made public kind of questioning. Um, so knowing how hard it might have been to see the work, I hope you'll all be able to come back. Um, it's on through May 6th. We're running the project, uh, the exhibition, through the full semester. And um, so finding a time that you could really understand the multi-layered aspect of the work, not only the, the, the sound, the images, the subtitles, but the three screens, uh, multi-perspective work. So please come back. Um, tonight's the launch with this wonderful um, speaker series. We will have another series of speakers um, April 18th in connection with the Multicultural Film Festival. Uh, Kathy Portuguese, who's the director of the festival and director of the um, Interdepartmental Film Studies here at UMass in conversation with um, Dan uh, Sack, who is with Performance Studies, and Nicola Courtright, who is in Art History at Amherst College. So that's April 18th. Um, a few people I want to thank before turning this over. Uh, the Marion Goodman Gallery in New York had been very helpful and uh, extraordinary uh, making possible the, the work. Rose Lord is the, uh, one of the directors of the gallery who is here tonight. Uh, thanks to her and her gallery, and of course, thanks to the extraordinary staff of the UM UMCA. Um, Craig Alban, our installation manager, worked several months on, on building the structure to the artist specifications. Chad Selig, our grad assistant, and being joined just these past few days by someone from Finland who came over um, at the request of the artist. So it was just great teamwork, and of course, our wonderful staff, a lot of dedicated work that goes on behind the scenes. Ava Fierst. Education Curator, Justin Griswold, our Registrar, and uh, this year we have Donna Carpenter as our Business Manager. So thanks to all of you. And uh, deep thanks, honor, and pleasure to have our three speakers here tonight. Um, I think what we're gonna do is, uh, the order will be uh, Fraser, Jay, and Monique. I'm gonna introduce each one just prior to their five to eight minute um, off the cuff prepared uh, who knows what, it's gonna be an interesting <laughs> evening. It'll be very exciting to hear what they have to say. Uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, I'll put this back on the stand. So please uh, don't be shy, come up with your questions uh, because we wanna have this as a conversation. Um, continue the questioning that, that the artwork inspires. So I will first introduce Fraser. Um, Fraser to the, uh, my left, your right. Fraser Stables is an associate professor of art at Smith College. In his own artwork, Fraser works in photography and video using conventions of documentary and performance in order to explore the construction of narrative and identity. His work has been exhibited in museums and galleries in the US, Canada, and Europe. And he was an artist in residence at the CORE program, which is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Fraser is also a co-founder of Atopia Projects, an independent curatorial and publishing organization. Welcome, Fraser. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Loretta, for inviting me and for um, the opportunity for us to discuss this. Um, Jay and I talked a little about this. You know, we've had frag it's fragmented talks, and um, 
we both have, uh, there are elements about the work that we're interested in, excited about, confused about. Um, and I, I think, you know, Loretta asked us to reflect on our own practice a little in relationship to this work. So I, ha I have a set of thoughts that um, I'm not going to read from, but I'm going to touch between a few different topics. And um, if it's fragmented, I, I'm announcing that, so I don't need to apologize for that later. But um, I will drift between a few kind of responses that I've had about the work. Um, one of the things in my own work, just to give some kind of framework, um, as Loretta introduced, um, I'm interested in this relationship between the documentary, the staged. Um, I'm also interested, I would say, in a, in a type um, of event or a type of narrative. I'm interested in moments that, um, um, much like one might find in a, in a Beckett story, moments that are almost insubstantial or almost too insubstantial to be a grand narrative. Um, and so as I sort of approach this work, I see a lot of grandia. And, um, uh, whereas in my own work, I'm thinking of a lot of sort of fragmentary events and moments and relationships and parts of biographies that are understood or not. Um, I come in here and I sort of see a narrative that one knows. I, I would describe myself, I guess, in this context as a lapsed, lapsed Episcopalian, but I figure that a, a lapsed Episcopalian doesn't sound so good. It's not as dramatic or meaningful as it might be if it were it to be another religion. But I do have to rack my brain and reflect upon those moments um, where I went to Sunday school, where I was sort of ran through these stories. Um, in artwork, I'm always interested in gaps. I'm interested in the moments that don't come together. Um, I'm intrigued by ideas such as that expressed by Manny Faber, the film critic and painter. He talks about termitic moments. He talks about those moments where, um, between the main narrative, the moments that might be unplanned or incidental. Um, he describes in one film someone walking across the street tapping the fire hydrant. It, it isn't necessary for the narrative, but it's an element that's present. Um, rather than what he would refer to as the grand narrative, or in one of his essays, he writes about the gimp, and he writes about the kind of the way in which um, a film director or an artist might set in motion some symbolic content um, that is very known. So the, the kind of brooding stranger chewing in the cigarette, and we look and we understand the person had a troubled childhood, and they're tormented, and the, there's a darkness, and, and the audience is pleased because they got it, and the director is pleased because the audience got it. And so I come into this work, and I, 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 I'm trying to sort of work out where I am in relationship to this terrain of the grand narrative and the sort of incidental moments, the possibility of biographical information, um, my interest in materiality or the relation between materiality and that which isn't material. So I look at the carpet. I think a blue carpet. I think that's, that's meaningful. That's a blue carpet. But I also think it's probably a you know, synthetic fabric. That's not meaningful, right? So we have something that's meaningful and something that's material. Um, and, and as I go through it, that's the way in which I start to pass work. Um, on the first comb through, I, I, I found the symbolic nature of it to be kind of weighty and sort of heavy-handed or very sort of um, over-present. Um, as I went through subsequent, subsequent viewings, um, it started to unravel a little bit. And I found those types of gaps, those types of termitic moments that... Um, I enjoy in work. So th there are points as I, I look at it and um, think, for instance, um, about the Raven's viewpoint at the beginning of the film. And I think of the beginning of anything as being so key. I'm often saying to my students when we're discussing a reading, you know, what was the first sentence? The first sentence of many readings tell you exactly what is going to happen in the phrasing and the tense. Um, and when I sort of look at the text at the beginning, this invitation to think of the world in different ways, or the world as non-singular, um, and I see the raven, I see this moment where the screen splits, and I, I have a panoramic that allows me to understand the multiple screens can be one screen, um, but then the reminder that there can be separation and distinction between these individual moments of viewpoint. Um, and then one of the things that interests me, I guess, is the moment where you, you have the viewpoint mimicking that of the raven or substituting that of the raven. Um, and as I look at that, I'm, I'm thinking of... I guess what is being documented, um, because I see this as a work where I continually ask myself what is being documented, what is being presented, what is the, the stuff that is documented. And I think one of the things that's documented in artwork, and especially here, is the intent. So I'm thinking of the intent. Okay, I read this as the intent. It's 
the raven looking, we're in that place. We're no longer the person, but we're still looking from a single viewpoint. But then it doesn't correlate. So then I have the moment where it doesn't quite match the way the raven's moving. So in that moment, again, I, I'm sort of interested in what opens up. Um, and for me, I, I, I guess there's two possibilities. One is they did a bad job, right? Sort of someone didn't get it right. The movement doesn't mimic it correctly. The other is that there's meaning in that gap. And I, I guess I, I like to hope the second is, is, is the, the possibility, or it's the one that I enjoy thinking about. Um, on thinking in that discrepancy and thinking on the way in which discrepancy can open meaning, um, but also thinking about the intention for discrepancy. So I get into this entanglement where I'm thinking of intent, and I'm thinking of these layers of intent within the work. And that's something that carries through many of the moments in the, in the work for me. Um, you know, as I was thinking of you know, these, these sort of moments of discrepancy or precarious meaning, um, you know, the moment where the actress is trying to fly, and, and, and it's a moment where she doesn't need to fly, right? It's, she's not the angel. Um, she's been told she's not the angel. She doesn't turn out to be the angel. So it's a moment where something is being practiced for, something is being rehearsed, but it's incidental to, to the main event. And so as I grapple with the work, I, I find more and more of these incidental moments that actually um, sustain an idea or, or a line of questioning um, that allows me to see past the grand narrative. Um, you, you know, we had some interesting discussions, Jay, before this about you know, how one approaches this and uh, the fact that the artist herself in many you know, of, the, of the fragments that we've read um, speaks of it not as a religious work. And, yet we're confronted by this abundance of religious iconography. So um, I, as I'm finding these spaces, it allows me to enter it through an idea of practice and rehearsal. I can start to engage the questions of um, w whether something truly is, if, if it's rehearsal or if it's reenactment, um, what the image itself that's being held by these people, these, by, by each of these actors, <coughs> whether that image is an image of the truth or whether that image is a plan for the play, um, why we go to the image rather than the story, and these sort of questions of how information is passed and shared um, and how we base one thing upon the other starts to become a larger narrative or is a larger narrative for me within the work. Um, and it's certainly within that line of questioning that I, that I, um, I can engage the work. Um, there's something as well I, I, I was reflecting on, and it's partly in relation to some projects I've done. Um, but the sort of the use of blue, the, the use of certain objects, you know, the, um, the, the I, I like blue. I like blue as, as something that, in this context, is meaningful, is substantial, but is nothing. It's, it's sort of its presence is about absence. Its presence is about that which it isn't. That sort of idea interests me. Um, I did a lot of work a um, number of years back where I was working with blue light boxes and I was projecting images onto them, so moving images on this blue field. And so you ended up with a blue and white image or a blue and muted colored image as the blue filled in the space, the, the void of the projected image. It sort of provided this sort of, uh, the screen became this meeting point between these conditions of light and image. Um, and as I see the green screen in here, um, in this moment where um, the, the green screen, w this sort of technical um, moment, this moment where um, the production of anything is possible, um, it's sort of like a revision of the blue. It's sort of like this sort of newer way or, or um, more common way now of creating not blue screen but grease, green screen. So it's kind of an evolution of that shared space or the, the, the moment where the blue of um, Mary coincided with the blue of the backdrop wh where someone would be trying to work with blue, um, blue screen technologies where one's imposing one reality upon the other. So that, that sort of presence of the technical, that presence of um, this, the color that is meaningful but which can be substituted um, is also an area that, that I found pretty interesting to think about. I'm probably at my time now. I'm going to pass on to you, Jay, and hopefully our conversations will merge and continue mm. afterwards. Can I interrupt to say who you are? <laughs> sure. For those of you who don't know Jay Garfield, he is the Doris Silbert Professor in the Humanities Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Logic Program, and of the Five Colleges Tibetan Studies and India Program at Smith College, Professor of the Graduate Faculty of Philosophy here at UMass, Professor of Philosophy at Melbourne University, and Adjunct Professor of Philosophy at the Central University of Tibetan Studies. He's the author of over 50 articles addressing questions in the philosophy.
philosophy of mind, the foundations of cognitive science, developmental psycholinguistics, philosophical logic, ethics, hermeneutics, and translation theory, Buddhist philosophy and cross-cultural interpretation, and the history of Indian philosophy in the 19th and 20th centuries. The thrust of Jay's very extensive activity as a scholar and teacher has been to forge intellectual connections and relationships between Western and non-Western traditions in philosophy, of philosophy. He's committed to bringing hermeneutical techniques and other modern modalities of Western thought to bear on Buddhist studies. Jay's publications are too numerous to recount here, but foremost among these are the groundbreaking translations of the great Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna's treatise, The Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, and the great Tibetan Buddhist philosopher scholar Song Kappa's Ocean of, of Reasoning, which is a commentary on Nagarjuna's work. In inviting Jay to discuss the Annunciation tonight, we figured the encounter of an artwork that revolves around belief and miracle with someone whose predilection is to question the very grounds of belief could be intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and as you can hear, I, I know absolutely nothing about art, so I'm here as the village charlatan. Um, that's okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how this piece um, strikes me and um, about the openings for thought that it, that it provided. I think that a lot of what I'm going to say is going to follow on, um, fortunately, for, from what Fraser said, because Fraser knows what he's talking about. Um, for me, I, I should, another piece of background, when I was asked to do this originally, I declined on the grounds that I knew nothing about art. And then when Greg told me it was about the Annunciation, I accepted because I kind of collect Annunciation images, which is one of my stranger hobbies. Um, and I'm, I've been fascinated by the Annunciation for a long time. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and why I'm fascinated by it. I'll come, I'll come back to that. Um, to me, the, almost the pivot point in this piece is very early on. As, as Fraser said, the opening is important. It's that wonderful question that's asked, what happens when the everyday becomes miraculous? Um, to me, that's kind of what the piece is about in a complicated way, but then a lot radiates from there. Um, let's come back to thinking about the Annunciation and then work our way, our way back through that. When you look at Renaissance images of the Annunciation, one of the things that you're struck by, or at least that I'm struck by, is the tremendous variety of affect depicted in Mary. Um, Atiya focuses on three of those affective states, um, humility, fear, and um, I'm having one of these wonderful moments, right? Humility and, 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 and friendliness, right? But there's a lot of others. There's total disbelief in some images. There's astonishment. There's this kind of total rejection that you would sometimes see. I don't have time for this. I've got a life. You know, what's this son of God stuff? Um, and there's this tremendous range of, of affect represented, which is what fascinates me. Because the question that the Annunciation itself is a phenomenon, well, not a phenomenon, but as a representation, because it, it exists only for us as an icon, raises for me is, um, what do you do with the completely um, unexpected, the completely incomprehensible, the completely unique, and the miraculous? Um, there's, a, there's a kind of weird um, moment in the piece where we're told that Mary was given to the church when she was three years old. And we know how weird that is because, of course, there was no church when there was Mary. Um, the church doesn't happen for 100 years later. I don't know what that's about. Um, but it's partly about the fact that the Annunciation has become, it just exists as icon, not, not as phenomenon. And the, icon, and the iconography gets read back. But when we think about the Annunciation, um, you think about this nice Jewish girl le leading her life, and then this bird flies, this angel comes in, right, and starts telling her all this stuff that makes no theological sense at all in a Jewish context. It makes great theological sense retrospectively if you're looking at it from a Catholic perspective. But from a Jewish context, it's complete nonsense. Um, and so what do you do if, an, if you're sitting reading a book and an angel comes in and tells you this nonsensical stuff that you're going to give birth to the Son of God, and by the way, you're going to do it asexually? Um, <laughs> How are you supposed to react to that? What are you supposed to do? Um, I see this film as playing with that question. What are you supposed to do? And then why is it important to worry about that? Why, why is the iconography so powerful? Well, the iconography, I think, is so powerful is because that's basically what life is. 
um, this particular conversation that we're having now has never happened before. Um, it's a completely novel situation. It's unexpected. We don't know what's happened and what's going to happen. And the question is, how do we react to it? Um, how do you react when you recognize that every moment of your life is miraculous? Um, the variety of enunciation representations is about that. And so there's this tension, constant tension in the work between the mundane and the everyday and the miraculous. And we see that in the iconography, right? We've got all these very mundane, prosaic shots of chairs and mules and Finnish suburban roads and, and stuff like that. And then all of these big transcendental images and this kind of grand narrative going on. And we get this kind of juncture of the everyday. We get this totally kind of what masquerades as a kind of naive recording of what's in front of us. And then we notice that all the color saturations turned way up and there's all this strange um, and, and very beautiful um, uh, organization um, to the images. Um, we have an artist who makes this absolutely staggeringly iconographic uh, film who then tells us that there's nothing religious about it. Um, a piece that is confined within a gallery, but then we recognize there's these issues, right? Like who are these women? Um, that's important to the piece of work. They're not actors who have been hired, right? There's, there's something important about that, but that's something we can only find out by extra gallery reading or looking at interviews. So the, the borders of the work of art bleed outside of the, of the gallery in important ways, even though the, the work of art tells us it's constrained. We have this wonderful um, playing with perspective so that one of the themes that the artist tells us the work is about and that it's surely in part about is this relationship as she puts it between the animal and the human world, but really about the multiplicity of perspectives on the world and the difference between how a donkey sees things as it walks along and how a raven sees things and how we see things. And so we get this illusion of this tremendous freedom of different perspectives and different viewpoints but that illusion is given to us by a single camera viewpoint that's controlled by Atia, right? So you've got this kind of presentation of the kind of freedom to see the world differently as long as you see it in exactly this way in exactly this order. So it's all these tensions in the work and I see it as a kind of uh, a complicated mass of contradictions that is um, asking us to really think about the way in which the um, incongruity and the, um, the uh, contradictory nature of, of life gets led moment to moment, um, transcendent and yet completely imminent, um, multiple but yet unified in a singular way, confined but yet bleeding out in all of these important ways, um, directed but also spontaneous, um, miraculous and also completely mundane. And um, it's very hard to know what to do with all of that, but uh, that's where it took me. summarize and then to um, keep the conversation going we'll, we'll turn it over to maybe among yourselves and then to the audience. Bonnie so, Kolf is Associate Professor of Philosophy in the School of Humanities, Arts and Cultural Studies at Hampshire College. She teaches and writes in the areas of aesthetics and philosophy of art and culture. Her articles investigate the aesthetics of race and nation, the gender detail, beauty and coloniality, forms of address, and other subjects pertaining to the connections between aesthetics, politics, and difference. In 2009, she edited Aesthetics and Race, New Philosophical Perspectives, a special volume of contemporary aesthetics. And her book manuscript, The Cultural Promise of the Aesthetic, is currently now under review. She is co-authoring the book, Reclaiming the Aesthetic in Latin America. Welcome. Thank you, Loretta. <coughs> In a work that addresses, as Jay pointed out, the multiplicity of worlds, <coughs> and um, in which uh, a group of women reenacts um, expressions and postures and affects um, drawn from paintings, historical paintings of annunciations, I'm struck uh, by the fact that in this list of three affects and postures, a kind greeting, humility, and a fearful, a fearful turning away that maintains the gaze. In this list, uh, wonder is absent. Wonder, a, uh, which you would expect to be a preoccupation in a work that engages the question of miracles and surprise, as the opening uh, quotes um, 
testify. So where is the wonder in this work? Well, perhaps it's in the forging of analogies that uh, the work visually creates, constructing and deconstructing forms, forging differences, new differences, and forging new parallels, surprising parallels between persons, birds, donkeys, a donkey's ears, Christmas decorations, um, analogies, <coughs> correspondences between drawings, paintings, vacuum cleaners, uh, carpets and drawings, so an act of vacuum cleaning versus postures of birds, acts of reading, seeing, listening, touching, and postures of animals. So these unexpected um, analogies that the work articulates um, across high art, low art, Santa versus uh, Da Vinci, guitar, a person singing music, uh, accompanying himself by the guitar versus Baroque, and uh, singing in church music. So. The transgression of these boundaries visually through a play of form is what creates wonders, wonder for those of us, uh, all of us who are invested in these boundaries between species, between people and, and, and things, between people and animals. So uh, wonder uh, arises from this kind of uh, deconstructive um, uh, reorganization of form. It arises when Mary falls, for example, and there is this theme of the fallen women and, and in, in the song at the end. So these unexpected correspondences and when the women start poking holes in the canonical narrative of Annunciation, when they start playing with the script, wonder. Wonder also when a woman acts in a role of a um, um, male angel. Wonder when and surprise when uh, in the class switching, because these are the actors, the non-professional actors are uh, people who were in uh, a sort of shelter, I understand. Um, uh, so there is a certain class switching going on as well. So uh, wonder in this dissection and performance of affect and the taking on of postures from elsewhere. Wonder as a gap emerges between the body, the bodies of the actors and uh, the subjectivity that we read into them. So um, I spoke of the disruption of boundaries. The disruption of boundaries in, in philosophical terms uh, that um, you know, evokes what, what uh, Jay and Fraser have spoken about in terms of grand narratives, some grand historical philosophical narratives and conceptual frameworks oppose nature to culture or oppose mind to body. You see in the disruption of the human-animal uh, opposition and a, a realignment of nature and culture, a realignment also of gendered configurations associated with the nature, culture, mind, body divide where, where femininity goes on the nature body side and masculinity goes traditionally on the culture side. So you see this rupture, disruption of the virgin mother whore alignment when we're at, against the background of the blue sketch of the Demoiselle d'Avignon, the Picasso, the, the, the figuration on the wall of the studio that resonates with the, the uh, very Orientalist uh, Picasso painting that appropriated African forms of abstraction and sculpture and masks uh, for an avant-garde Western, white Western artistic project. So you see an interruption of various cultural boundaries. You see an interruption of the alignment, the tidy alignment between man, nature, and the divine. So now you know when a donkey starts eating the dreadlocks of Mary, um, some of these, uh, of the actors playing Mary or biting and chewing, you know, some of these visual analogies become funny and make us wonder, but also put us back into certain old scripts because historical hierarchies reassert themselves in this practice of analogy production. So we have here, and Loretta and I were speaking about this, the phallic linear trajectory of the angel. We have in the ending scenes when Mary walks with the donkey, an animal that is on the leash, right? Mary is not on the leash of the animal. 
um, we have. So we have in this free play of analogy production, so, uh, in, in, this, in this experimentation with wonder, this wondrous experimentation, we also have the repetition of the appropriation of African masks in the background. We have Mary with the dreadlocks that for her self-stylization, a white woman for her self-stylization, um, and lists African-American forms. The, we, and we see these forms of appropriation, visual appropriation, um, that um, in fact do not open up the voices within the piece to the voices of subaltern uh, speakers who's, and, and art makers and image makers. Um, we have a white uh, staging of analogies. So this then puts us back into some old colonial uh, scripts that are fairly familiar, that are well known. So this is one of the tensions, the mm -hmm. tensions between wonder and the familiar, that the opening, uh, that, that the opening quotes um, make us think about. So philosophically, this, ra this raises the problem of what counts as strange, by what criteria, and to whom, and what counts as familiar, and what doesn't. Now, I think actually um, the, the installation forges a very fascinating approach to um, this conundrum through this difficulty of this reinstitution of the old uh, boundaries. And um, I wanted to say a few words uh, about that if I have time. Do I have time for that? Great. Um, and my, we were asked, invited to bring our own work into these questions, and I work on the concepts of the aesthetic, which I approach in terms of promises and threats. Um, and um, what strikes me in this uh, work is that um, you see an enormous affirmation of the agency of women. The camera is often focused on women's faces. So we see women looking at other women, looking at one another, engaging, looking at um, you know, vacuum cleaning, women being perceptually and physically engaged in the world. So there's on the one hand that agency of women, and on the other hand, there is this location of women within a world of images that these women take in, that these women, they look at the, at the, at the old annunciation, uh, at copies, photocopies of the old annunciation paintings, and they reenact fantasies. We see these actors reenacting re old fantasies with the help of all these um, historical images that they engage. Now, if we then raise the question of wonder, we can see that the director the figure of the director wonders when in the machinery of uh, learning to fly, right? Very poignant, symbolic phenomenon that the actress learning to fly. And the gaze of the director is, uh, is one of surprise. So in this um, uh, engagement of the director with, these, with this project of performing the poses and performing the affects um, registered in, in the Annunciation paintings, we see this affect of wonder, a feeling of wonder break through. It breaks through the sort of project of performance, the performative project. So this means there is the staging, there's the act of performing, and then you know, the effect doesn't really arise in there, but it comes later, this, this feeling of wonder. Um, and the same thing happens at the level of the viewer when you walk through this wondrous blue space that Fraser talked about. You know, you are like the bird flying uh, high up, or, and you are, through the cinematography, put down back onto some floor. Um, the viewer flies with the birds, with the Holy Ghosts in the uh, cathedral, but the view imaginatively, but the viewer also walks in the shit uh, where the two Holy Ghosts are sort of pursuing one another on the uh, floor of the gallery. 
So there is this uh, engagement of the viewer within the spaces. And in that light, what also strikes me very much is the empty spaces, the many empty spaces, especially of the left screen. And these are spaces of the, work, uh, the working woman, right? The seamsters, the sewer. Um, these are women's workspaces, the artist's studio. Uh, these empty spaces ask, make us ask what what is the human? They make the self strange. Then there is the uh, there are the many partial views that uh, we get of donkeys, that we get of roads. So um, perception is always perspectival in the Nietzschean sense, or in contemporary standpoint theory sense. It's always grounded. It's always incomplete. It's always from a particular viewpoint. It's never whole. Uh, uh, speaking about the, the positioning of the viewer here. And this raises the question of what attitude to adopt vis-a-vis -vis that history of images that um, engage our fantasies and desires and in which we are embedded. So um, it raises, for example, the question of how is art making different and like taking a stroll in the quote-unquote world of animals and men. Um, so I feel that by locating us uh, within a field of questions about our relations to spaces and images, um, Attila um, makes available a uh, position that recognizes that these historical images and our aesthetic investments in them both articulate promises for us and constitute threats. So there is this double-sidedness of being imminent as aesthetic agents, as feminine agents, as gendered agents. There is this imminence within this fabric of aesthetic promises and threats. And then with respect to the particular poignancy of this notion of an annunciation, which sort of, and we can maybe talk more about that and how you see this from the perspective of the history of mm -hmm. annunciation images, an annunciation that sort of phases uh, back and forth between a command a promise, a threat, and a guarantee. The annunciation is a kind of complex act of address. And within that field of what the, var the various kinds of things an annunciation can be and entail, I feel that Attila is moving the idea of the annunciation in the direction of a set of promises and threats. And this, I think, is very um, original and significant with respect to the question of the aesthetic today and with respect to the problematic of that not all analogies are equal. You know, not uh, some analogies are reversible and some analogies are not reversible. Analogies are asymmetrical. There are these historical asymmetries between birds and persons and um, male persons and female persons there, and um, donkeys and, um, uh, uh, and persons, and white women wearing dreadlocks and African-American women wearing dreadlocks and, and African modes of abstraction and white appropriative mode of abstraction. There are these inequalities between these kinds of analogies. And by thinking about the promises and threats that the various forms entail, I think we can uh, you know, recognize the significance of these images and the way in which we inhabit these images aesthetically, while also uh, raising moral and aesthetic and political questions about it. That was my, those were my thoughts. Mm. Uh, should we open the questions now, or do you you want to comment among yourselves? And I, but how should we do the format? Any Questions will be great. Yeah. Right from the audience. Yeah. Okay. Talk for a long the, time. Um, the floor available. Anyone? Eva, coming no, forward? No, no, I, I'm just wanting to find uh -huh. out.
wanted to ask Fraser. Um, I was struck, in it, and maybe it's like these moments, these sort of what you called empty spaces, or throughout the piece, there are quite a number, but one of the ones that strikes me most forcefully, and it's about the experience of being in the audience. Um, okay, so the crows looking at the beautiful Finnish landscape, and she's doing a little bit of poetry, and then Santa walks in. Okay, now you smile, and I'm sitting there, and no one in the audience laughs. And I'm thinking, this is very funny, but I'm not laughing. You're with the wrong audience. The people with me were laughing. Okay, <laughs> but, all right, so maybe, but still, the question that I have about, she says the words, and Santa walks in exactly the same way she's saying the poetry. There's another part also where I think my, the reaction that I think mentally would be appropriate is not the reaction I'm having as a member of the audience. And I felt sort of dampened throughout the whole thing. You know, um, seeing the Mary with her dreadlocks being chewed and she's smiling at the donkey. And I'm not laughing. It's funny. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, so there's something about those moments that made a difference in me as an audience. And I know it, I also looked around, I, I watched it twice today. I looked around it up, no one else was laughing or, people seemed almost stunned. Mm -hmm. it, like an enunciation kind of, <laughs> but anyway, there were other moments. And I'm thinking about the, the point you brought up about these empty spaces and a kind of rhythm of them in the piece. And I'm just wondering what that is. That, and you were talking about disconnection, and I was thinking about, you know, the emotional, mental, emotional reaction versus my actual reaction to the piece. And, and I'm puzzled by that. Yeah, I think that's a kind of, you know, well phrased observation. I, I, um, I mean, I, I think there is, you know, the the kind of discord you're speaking about. I think is present, and I, I think, um, you know, I, and seriously, the group that was in with me was was really laughing at all those points. It was sort of like right on point. The, the, the donkey's chewing the hair, that's funny, Santa's funny. Um, but I, I, I know what you mean about there being that tension um, or, or perhaps the question of how one should respond. And I, I partly I feel that weight when one's in such a coded environment. Right? This, it sort of introduces a, an idea that um, there, there is this fixed meaning being given. There's this play and, and sort of re-engagement of that meaning or redeployment mm -hmm. of that meaning. There are moments that seem incidental to that, but actually might be meaningful within this redeployment. Um, and so I, I think for myself, a lot of that, those <laughs> gaps or the, those moments where I'm trying to negotiate the discord um, are where I'm trying to navigate wh what I should be thinking, what I am thinking, and, and sort of putting that together. Um, and, and Antia encourages that both because of the intertextuality with the Renaissance images, but also with that little iconography lesson she makes sure you get at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so when you get that little iconography lesson, you're partly being told, read this film, read this installation iconographically. Mm -hmm. And that really does, I think, dampen everything. Now you're sitting there thinking, damn, I'd better not miss a symbol. <laughs> you know, what if there's a swallow and I miss it, right? Um, and. I think there is that kind of response to the, um, I mean, it's a heavy piece in the sense of being heavy handed. It's, even when it's light, you're not quite sure. Maybe there's, maybe I'm missing something, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, some of the women are raising questions about the proper annunciation narrative. So yeah. doesn't that give you permission to play with the script, to throw it over, to not follow what you take to be canonical interpretations. It gives you permission, but in your words, there's also a threat that you might look as naive as they do. It adheres, Better watch closely. It adheres, the film adheres pretty well to the Renaissance schema of mm -hmm. the Annunciation. Oh. Um, even, even, um, the way the setup is in the, in, the, in the Annunciation scene when um, the angel comes in, it's set up exactly like a Renaissance painting. Um, so she, she, she. Um, I think one of the uh, interesting things about the film is the way um, we're 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 following a script, the script of the Renaissance Annunciation paintings, 
and nobody really believes in this iconography anymore. And the question is about the wonder in the film, is how, how we are led to actually experience wonder. And I think we do experience wonder at different points in the film, where there's breaks mm -hmm. in the um, expectations and the action. Um, where the director, where for instance, the um, Mary all of a sudden hugs the other actress. And uh, that's a moment which is totally unplanned. And the director is taken aback by it. And she's no longer acting at that point. Yeah. Um, and then there's the angel when she's upside down. And there's various points in the film like that, the Santa Claus appearing. Um, so um, I think what's interesting to me is how she's using the enunciation, but really using it as a pretext in a way. And at the same time, it has this, this wonder sometimes goes moves over into the religious um, devotional or aspect, but it also is about, it's about play. It's about um, using the enunciation as a metaphor for the artwork, about for how art uh, functions and can lead us to um, some kind of novel perception. Yeah, and this is in part a work about the staging of an enunciation, and in that respect, it asserts limits on wonder. I think, and on the miraculous. It's not a celebration of wonder and the miraculous, and I'm interested in those limits it asserts in uh, keeping us aware of scriptedness. Um, and I think with that uh, resource, the artist addresses this fundamental epistemic problem, engaging the act of wonder, you know, or curiosity about otherness. Often the white uh, male uh, middle class mind has um, celebrated its capacity for wonder as a kind of mode of uh, bridging um, boundaries of power and entrenched boundaries of power in a way that simply reassert those boundaries because curiosity and openness to strangeness does not simply address the reality of uh, historically instituted cultural boundaries. So that um, is a philosophical problem for the power of wonder to shake up um, cultural hierarchies, which is something the film is interested in, and, and Attila is interested in, in the context of earlier work, as in where is where. So I think some of those questions come to the current work. So I don't think there is a celebration of uh, wonder. Um, I don't fully agree. I don't think it's a celebration, but I think it's um, an actual actualization of wonder. The film that artworks in some, help, some capacity do, do um, lead us into a space of reflection, but also of um, um, in, in captivation in a way. That, that why, why, are we, why are we moved? Why are we moved by something that we don't believe in? Why, why you know, why are, what, what there, there are elements in the film that move beyond the story that, um, there are moments in the film which, are wondrous in themselves, in a sense. Yeah, I would like to, to second that because I, I mean, whole my perspective was just like I came into that. I don't need that. I'm loud. I came into that, into the, into the film, and I sat down, and I was immediately, within a very short moment, I was thrust into this sense of like a tone. I was thrust into a sense of a large amount of feeling in my body. So I was, no, I was not coming at this piece anymore at that point from, from what the enunciation may have been in terms of any schematic thing, but more the inner meaning of the birth of consciousness or something like this, if I want to get to that. But there was a tone, and then there was a sense that I started looking at the animals, and I started looking at the birds. And I started looking, and I said, I understand what is going on here. I can't say it, but I understand what this person is doing. This person is singing this amazing song. And I felt very soft 
and warm and loving towards all those people in the room. And it brought a certain quietness to me that was very profound. And uh, and that in itself, that in itself was like was 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 uh, a piece of grace, you know. I mean, uh, because there's something there's something in this immaculate conception that is is an inner meaning, an esoteric meaning of a grace. Mm -hmm. I mean, consciousness is a grace. The animal is a grace, and, and she did it. And I don't know how she did it. She did it, but she performed this mystery with these people walked in this room. Hello, 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 and that was. The, the introduction was just touching. You can feel it from the beginning. I mean, with the, um, the landscapes at the beginning, you have this incredible landscape, and you have the questioning superimposed on the landscape. So you have right away, from the very beginning, the announcement of the film of the questioning, but also the wonder that the two are juxtaposed. A small comment because uh, when the Santa Claus came, I I thought that was so wonderful, and the reason was the reason was that because I'm from Norway, so Finland is very similar. But the reason was something about the, the Annunciation happened long time ago in Israel, so and so. But Santa Claus happens in Scandinavia every year, <laughs> and nobody believes in it. But every year we do it. And there is that sort of tension <coughs> of, oh, it's a myth, it's an illusion, we do it for the children. But we do it. And he's always dressed like that. Maybe he's changed a little fashion over the centuries. But there was something that sort of, it just reminded me of the similarity of the, the wonder of the Annunciation and the wonder of Santa Claus as banal, as precious, something mm -hmm. like that. That also <coughs> raises an issue that we really haven't talked about. And I was talking to Fraser about this thing. I really don't even know what to do with it. Um, but this is um, also very much an artwork that's about Finland. Um, the palette is white and blue. Um, it's about the Finnish flag, for God's sake. Um, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the faces are iconic Finnish faces. Um, it's a... The interiors are finished. I mean, it's 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 iconic, right? You look at it and you know you've got a, fil a film about Finland, and Finland, of course, is a Lutheran country and always has been. Um, not always, but you know, for its religious history, and this is a very Catholic um, representation. And so, another one of the tensions <clears throat> is this kind of exploration of this deeply Lutheran place um, in its landscape and its physiognomy. Um, in its ways of talking um, through this Catholic imagery. And I haven't even figured out what's going on there, but it's something that you, that you have to notice. And I, I want to second what you said I mean, for all of the kind of analysis that we're doing. The other thing to remember is it's a phenomenally beautiful piece and a phenomenally affecting piece, and you can't sit in there for 30 minutes and not be um, overwhelmed by it. Though at the end, then you start raising all these questions, and there's, that's maybe another tension. While you're there, you're not asking questions. When you come out, you're kind of full of them. Yeah. Um, I um, well, I love the, the the moment with Santa Claus. Also, I, I think you know there was something about the red that was just beautiful at that moment. Um, I don't actually have. A, a, my own opinion about this. I actually have a question um, just to open up. Um, I'm still kind of struck by the construction of the situation within the museum context. Mm -hmm. uh, just for me, I, I, maybe I'm very conservative, but when I go to a museum and I'm told that I'm going to be watching someone's film, especially when it's cinematic in the sense that it's an extension of storytelling, you know, that, that really hits me very hard. And um, I found uh, the aspect of the storytelling and, and its formal arrangement in the opportunity of the museum to be a, a kind of a very unusual moment. Um, I was thinking earlier about what you had brought up in terms of the 
dislocation of the plot as it evolved through the different surfaces uh, and how it always dislocated at the same time. And it, it made me think of um, John Cage, who said that he refused to listen to recorded music or reco basically recordings, uh, unless they were put in uh, machine relationships where they would go out of sync by chance. So I, I'm not aware that the, the unfolding of the film changes each time. That there, there seems to be a, a complete synchronous relationship between all of the uh, screens. That's the same yep. every single time. So, you know, I, I'm wondering if you have some views as to the, the plasticity and, and exploitation of storytelling. Uh, and I mean, not negatively exploited, I just mean just putting into play. Um, the use of storytelling cinematically in the museum opportunity. You're looking at That's me. you, Fraser. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel, <laughs> in a way, I, I feel it as to be a very familiar thing at this point in time. I, I you know, when I, I guess when I walk in here, I think, okay, it's a, it's a loop. It's a continuous loop. Is, is there a signal? At, as to are the credits, does it feel like a formal film? Are there seats? Can I roam? How do I behave in relationship to the others? So that kind of social space of just viewing that is outside of the theater, I, I feel is pretty familiar um, for me at this point in time. The, I mean, I, for me, it was the sort of incidental details, you know, the walking onto the blue from the other surface. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I got a kick out of the, the gallery tracks continuing through and then having that kind of echo of the the track that allowed the angel to be an angel and so it, it, these are the elements that became sort of documented in a way for me when I was talking at these levels of documentation I felt that this as a site um, actually became an extension and because the, the the work is continually sort of showing versions of the same or viewpoint from or viewpoint of or viewpoint to um, it, it, it allows me to kind of think of the context as a bit of an extension of that. So I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I didn't have any more thoughts beyond that. I mean, I, I felt it was familiar, but I enjoyed these moments of transition um, and interjection that kind of happened just because of the structure and the, the design of the, the space. Um, the last time Loretta asked me to kind of talk in, in one of these um, events, I was in conversation with Bayat Strilly and that was another kind of deployment of large-scale moving image. And, and in that time, it was through the gallery. And my overwhelming sense in that was that it was very kind of urban. I felt like I was walking from one site to another. It felt like a, a sort of subway or a, a network of small buildings. Um, this is a very different feel. This is kind of like the pod in the gallery, and it's a special moment. Um, and, the, and one's very aware of the transition. Um, we're in it or we're out. Um, so I, I guess, you know, some comments on the structure, but, um, yeah. There is also a questioning of narrativization within the work itself, because the narrator speaks about the raven and about his point of view. The raven, um, you know, rehearsing clues from the environment. And right after that passage comes the Santa Claus. So at that moment, you think, well, what is narrativization? Is that imagining Santa Claus in the forest? And what is art making? Is that reproducing Santa Claus in the forest? Or what is our relation to these images uh, as we make art or as we reproduce images? And. Um, I think that shifts as you, your stance within that question shifts as you go through the work. And maybe you saw it now in a row, but you know, in a, in a gallery setting, you can walk in, see a snippet here, mm. see a snippet there. You never have the complete view and, and, uh, in that sense because of the three walls. Uh, you always have to look back and forth. So in that sense, maybe it's more constructive than narrative, but it plays with kind of narrativization uh, um, and plays this out in visual and uh, auditory terms at various registers. Mm. 
and the, the fact that it's it does run continuously and that you can enter it at, or leave it at any time also kind of raises these constant questions about where the boundary of the work of art is. Um, have you seen it only if you've seen it from the start to the finish? Or have you seen it if you've just happened to have seen a 30 minute slice in whatever order? Or have you seen it if you've seen a little piece of it? Um, that's a, a question that's always there, I think, with temporally extended pieces in galleries. And then there's a question, is, is the decision to show it on, an, on a constant loop mean that the, all of those options are open? Or is it just a matter of convenience? Should you figure out when it's going to start and walk in then? I think this work really requires a full, full viewing, as you just listed. Yeah, I think that's for sure. I think that's for sure. Um, there's also a lapse between the screenings. It's not, not continuous. So yeah. It's continuous. It's, really continuous. It's, it's continuous. It's like one minute, maybe. Oh, um, well, one thing I wanted to raise is that it was about the sound in the, in the film. Mm -hmm. The sound is so important in the film. Yeah. And um, for instance, there's this one sequence where she, um, the noise and the pigeons, and the pigeons are all clustered and so on. At mm -hmm. the end of that sequence of pigeons, um, there is this sort of like a bubble, 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 bubble. Mm -hmm. pigeons are all. And that, that meshes into the vacuum cleaning. That goes mm -hmm. straight into the vacuum cleaning. Yep. And the vacuum cleaning is so important because that puts the, the woman in doing that activity is in a non-space by the act, very act, in virtue of the act, very nature of the activity plus the sound. The sound is what leads her into a state of reverie. And the reverie is what triggers the enunciation scene. Mm -hmm. it's, it's her in a state of reverie calling up the, the Annunciation. So the status of the Annunciation event as, a, as an image or as a, as a fact is no longer factual. It's in the, we're in the space of fiction. The same way that we're in the space of fiction with Santa Claus. And so that transition from fiction into, into reality is going on constantly throughout the film. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most wonderful, wonderful things about it. Um, I think there was a question in the back as well. Maybe this takes us back too far, but I wondered what, what all of you thought about. Um, I've only seen it once this, this late this afternoon, and it struck me that there was such an ease with which the Mary figure took on the postures that she was asked to take on with respect to the Annunciation. It seemed as if, oh yeah, if it's gonna be I, that I have to be humble, I can do that. If, it, if it's that I have to be afraid, I can do that. If it's I have to be friendly, I can do that. As if there wasn't anything miraculous. This is something that we do all the time. We know what fear is, we know what friendliness is, we know what humility is, and so forth. So I guess against that background, I wondered, uh, I mean, maybe having only seen it once, there are obviously many more ways to uh, read that, and maybe something else emerges from this, but it, it struck me as uh, normalizing enunciation, making it seem as if it's such an everyday thing that anybody could come in and take that up. Oh yeah, we know what that means. Now maybe this has to do with um, what uh, er, an earlier person in the audience uh, spoke and, and said, well, this is something pe people do all the time, so yeah, we know how to take it on, but that very reenactment and the ease with which they were able to do it seems to work against the miracle, it seems to work against it. But maybe it doesn't. Well, I, I guess I, just to pick up on that, um, it, it strikes me that when we had those moments, it, in a way it was rehearsal, but in a way it was um, describing instances single instances of each, right? So yeah. each, each pose wasn't practiced, right? It was accepted, it was, it was presented, accepted, and then the next pose appeared. And the directorial um, instruction was to just do it as you would do it, right? So it, back to that idea of honesty or something that's earnest or factual every day. Um, and then I guess in relationship to this idea of something that is from the everyday, I, I just want to pick back up on um, 
something that, that, that my fellow panelists mentioned um, about the fact that these, in interviews, the artist does speak of these women as being like all but one was suffered from addiction of, to alcohol or drugs. And so they're presented in a very specific way, but it's not embedded within the film itself. So for me, that presents an interesting question. Like, is that something that is put out in a manner that is important? Is this something that should be leaked out? Is it something that affects how we read the work? Is the, is the work a documentation of those people with those issues being given this chance to act or perform or to engage this narrative? Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm kind of always interested in instances in art where, you know, someone is stuck. So there's a performance, but there's also the record of fact. And you have um, Jürgen Teller's Go Sees, where he photographed you know, I guess go sees is a term for fashion, wannabe fashion models, right? So you go and see the fashion photographer and, and you hope to be picked up and plucked and photographed. And he photographed these people, but on the doorstep, right? So he, he's sort of recording them. You want to be photographed by me? Sure. But then you get put into a book and it's called the go sees and you're sort of recorded as you were. Um, so you, you want it, you've got it, you're stuck. Um, or, you know, Philip Walker de Corsia when he photographed the hustlers in, in California and he's... Rec you know, it's sort of, you mix the idea of going to Hollywood to become a star with the documentation of, you know, it's, it's Jim from Arizona, he cost 20 bucks, right? But the title describes all of this information. So this stuckness with the fact of life mixed with the potential and the enactment and the fantasy and the fantastical um, is, is of great interest to me. And I think, so just to tie back to your question, I think of all of that trajectory of reality being connected to this one moment of performance um, of, of this gesture that is plausible but is also part of a performance? I think um, the idea of the enunciation as it appears in the um, installation um, is also a notion of um, something that is staged and to be staged and to be restaged and uh, lots of possibilities emerged there. Um, and ease of enactment is, is a very interesting dimension of that that you are bringing up. But uh, I think your question also raises the question, what is a miracle? And David Hume said, well, look, miracles, they don't really uh, emerge because there, there is no proof for any miracle ever because uh, a miracle would entail a act in violation of the laws of nature. Now, such a thing you can never show happens. You can never demonstrate proof happens. So what is a miracle that could allow us to ask? A miracle is this uh, kind of agreement, now we are going to be amazed, or now we are going to be not asking certain questions. This is surprising. And ooh, we have a certain feeling, and we um, don't raise certain questions. We accept maybe something. We say things like, uh, I'll take this on faith, or may things happen as you say they will happen. So this is a kind of procedural notion of belief that uh, people like uh, Pascal have thought about. Okay, let's now just make believe we believe, right? Let's kneel, let's do the actions that, uh, nor that, that would be associated, that traditionally are associ associated with believing. And then, whoop, miraculously, mm. miraculously, quote unquote, belief will follow. Well, that's just to say, a way of saying to believe exists in uh, adopting a certain material relation within these kinds of framings, these kinds of framings of knowledge and ignorance where we agree to ask certain questions and not other questions. Um, so I think it's interesting to bring this um, uh, philosophical uh, mm. problematic to bear on what you say about Finland. In a certain way, maybe you know, saying things like, here is Finland, or this is a Picasso, or this is how I, I see this and this and this image involves these kinds of uh, scripts with their pre-scripted arrangements of knowledge and ignorance. And that, that speaks also to the way the actors offer their names without us actually being, see, being able to see who is being spoken about. Mm. 
I wonder what you think about this, having yeah. thoughts about multiple belief systems or yeah. I guess multiple I, I, forms I, I of metaphysics. I disagree a, a little bit with you, both uh -huh. about taking the message from Hume, um, but in but in particular about what's going on here with, with respect to miracles and the everyday. Um, because I actually, but let, let me go back to Hume for a minute and then come, and then come, and come back here. In Of Miracles, one of the th ways that Hume characterizes miracles is a, a miracle is something that's never happened before, that just is completely, that violates regularities. It's a singularity. Um, as opposed to the kinds of things that happen all the time. We have to remember how Hume thinks about laws of nature in terms of regularities. Um, and so you might think, well, gee, of course, that's got to be right, because everything that happens is a thing of a particular kind, and those kinds of things happen all the time, and the world is kind of disenchanted and bereft of miracles. What I think is happening with the, the thinking about enunciation here and with this kind of um, focus on the mundane and the everyday, on the chair that she gets on to get on the donkey, on the littered um, uh, studio, on the pigeons instead of ethereal doves and so forth, um, is a reminder that everything that happens, happens only once, happens for the first time whenever it happens. And so by a Humean definition, the everyday, every moment of the everyday is already miraculous. The Annunciation isn't, in that sense, something unusual. Um, Annunciation is something that's happening moment to moment. And I think that, I mean, that's why I find the, the idea of the Annunciation so, um, so powerful, that it's not something that happens only in Renaissance paintings or that happened you know, once to a Jewish kid in Galilee, um, but rather, um, uh, if by enunciation we mean a kind of reminder that, our, that, that moments are unique, that our life is enchanted, that to the extent that by the miraculous we mean the singular, that miracles are happening moment to moment, that's the power of the enunciation. And so when I look at those takings on of those, um, of those affects so easily, what you see is a miracle happening easily, moment to moment, every day. When Santa Claus comes on, there's something quasi-miraculous, but there's also something totally quotidian. It's a guy in a Santa suit coming across because the director told him, come across now. When we look at those gorgeous, sumptuous landscapes of, of Finland um, at the beginning, there's something absolutely miraculous about the, those expanses of white and that lovely soft winter light. But that's every day in the winter in Finland, right? Um, and so I really see the, the most central and the most powerful theme of this thing. Um, and that's, I guess, when you were talking about grace, what comes to me is that it's opening up a space to see um, each moment of life as miraculous. And that's intention, of course. I mean, there's a, if every moment of life is miraculous, then you know, each one's unique just like all the others, and there's no more uniqueness, right? As I said, there's constant contradiction and tension here. But that's a very productive tension. And that's a tension that gives you a different kind of perspectival choice, not the choice to see things like a raven or a donkey or a camera, but rather the choice to see things as boring and quotidian or as constantly miraculous and to see what happens as um, unimportant or as an enunciation. And, and then that makes the, the loopiness very interesting because even though it's a repetition right away, the same thing, it's not the same. That's right. So That's right. But I think this piece is also about embodied states yeah. of uh, being in the world and with respect to others. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, the moments in which the women engage in dialogue, you mm -hmm. feel as if you're in the middle of dialogues. Yeah. And given that dimension of embodied imminence, um, and an, a form of embodied imminence also with respect to the environment, mm -hmm. right? With respect to, you know, signified yeah. in terms of trees and, mm -hmm. and, and birds and so forth that um, uh, exerts, that embodiment exerts a certain traction that makes the question of, of the miraculous or wonder or surprise or strangeness not just a matter of choice, 
to either be within the banal or, or the, the sphere of the miraculous. There is, you know, because just the fact of our being embodied beings restricts this dimension of choice. So no, 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 no. You cannot I mean, just at any moment make everything singular, ooh, wondrously singular and unexpected. No, no, I think, I, I guess I disagree with you deeply uh -huh. about that, both with respect well, to, to reality and, and, to, and, and with respect to the, the particular work of art that we're talking about. Um, here's what you don't have a choice about. You don't have a choice about whether you're embodied. Um, you can't be an angel. You don't have a choice about whether um, to engage with the people around you. That's another important thing about this film. It's a film that puts you as a viewer in engagement because of the fact that you're at the center of these three screens, right? And you don't have a, a choice about whether you live in a natural world because there ain't another world to live in, right? You're right about all of that. So imminence and embodiment and thrownness into all of this, that's just, factu that's just factual. What you do have a choice about um, is how you read that and how you respond to that. And you can either respond to it with boredom um, and just see it as every day, or you can respond to it um, aesthetically you can respond to it um, with wonder. You can respond to it in an intimate way that really takes um, the, um, the uniqueness and the miraculousness of each of these interactions seriously. And I think, I think that's a more interesting choice than the choice of whether to be a raven or a donkey or a camera, right? That part, I guess, I find you know, vaguely contrived. But if we, t if we take it as metaphorical, and as metaphorical for this choice, um, then I guess that's why I got interested in Annunciation pictures in the first place. Um, when I started looking at the Annunciation, I thought, yeah, how do you respond when an angel comes and tells you this crazy stuff? Um, what's the right thing to do? The right thing to do might be to say, what was it? What did I just drink, right? Um, what's going on here? Am I losing my mind? Who's this guy who just broke into my house wearing wings, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things you can say. Uh, exactly. Um, but, but, the, uh, but then, that doesn't, if you think about that simply as iconographic about a particular story in the New Testament, then it loses all interest for me. If I think of that as iconographic for my own life, um, and my own engagement with the world, then it actually becomes gripping. And then it really does become gripping. How do I respond to seeing this installation? How do I respond to a conversation with Monique and Fraser in front of a whole lot of people? Um, how do I respond to you know, a camera staring at me or to the light or to whatever, right? I mean, that becomes an interesting question because each of these is something that I've never encountered before. I haven't lived through this moment before. And so the, the question that the Annunciation raises is a question that whether we like it or not, here's where I'd say you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice but to face that question. But that question can be answered one of two ways. I either answer it with boredom or I answer it with wonder. And that's an interesting choice. There's a scene in this installation that I just cannot figure out why it's there. And I assume the artist is not random, that I mean, you only have so many minutes, and, and the artist put this scene in there for a reason. And I, I don't get it, okay? So I'm wondering other people's ideas. And um, there's a very simple thing, but it's not good enough, which is this is how you get places. Um, so the scene is right after Mary has ridden the donkey. And then there's a gray scene. It's not colorful, there are no bright hats. And it's a road. Cars going down a wet road in winter with lights coming the other way. It's a very mm -hmm. short scene. And I see it as one of these things that you, you were talking about. Something just unexpected. And yet it goes by and we don't, like my mind was like, what? But the rest of me, again, I was in a strange juxtaposition as a 
audience to this because I don't know how many people here can remember that scene with Bear, but it really struck me as what is that scene doing here? So I'd like to throw out that as a real question to the group. You start, Fraser. Yeah, I, I didn't get past, you know, the, the donkey becomes a car, right? That you're in this, this sort of space of kind of dumb equivalence. Well, a few machines. Right? Machine scenes. Even lifting her, besides the vacuum cleaning, even lifting her is hand pulling. Yeah. You know, but. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I, I got to that kind of, that, the sort of dumb equivalence between those moments, but it, it's. Um, but then there are, there are other discrepancies that are more subtle. It's sort of like the, the moment where you're seeing um, those architectural images. Mm -hmm. You're seeing them at first in color. Mm -hmm. There's c colored moments, and then you're seeing them... It, well, then black you're seeing them in the book in black and white or yeah. different images that no. look similar. So we're seeing something that hasn't been seen yep. in that space. And, you know, the pigeon walking seems to be, you know bridge those spaces in some way. It seems mm -hmm. to make sense that that is with the architecture, but then we're back in the studio and the sound continues. Mm -hmm. And that's a really complicated little moment where we go between these things we haven't seen that look like things we do see, and then it's bridged by audio that is plausible in one space, but only plausible if that space were real. The only thing that could throw me is the familiarity. Mm -hmm. That a scene like that in a movie has huge familiarity. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if other people have other ideas about why that scene is in there. Because she takes half a minute. Yeah. I, I it's transitioning yeah. to the studio. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and they're saying, right. now we're going to go back to the studio. But well, that's was, pretty mundane. It's going but, to the, it was to the, 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 the collapse yeah. of the narrative. It's a condensation of the narrative in a very kind of condensed and uh, succinct way that um, tells you what's happened. It makes, that makes the, the, the connection. So we're going from the farm back to but the house. I, yeah. I, I would agree that it's not necessary because transitions are provided <laughs> throughout. So it does yeah. become a, a, a choice at that one moment to have a transition, so it becomes a problem. Yeah. Whereas the transition's normally useful, at that point it kind of becomes this problem that you're presenting. It's a trick you can send to us, but it's not a transition. It's intelligible. It's through the donkeys, it's, it's that perspective as well. I thought it was the connection of the way that you were looking, that you were doing a contrast between the way the donkey's walking and then you're going to the automobile. Right. And the it donkey. It particularizes. It particularizes and problematizes a perspective that we take as given and unproblematic. That is the perspective of driving down a road um, that we just simply take as something hardly worth noticing. And I mean, I saw it as putting that alongside the really weird, bouncy perspective of being on a donkey right. and saying, these are each perspectives that require attention. Um, and the fact is we, we take the donkey perspective with attention and we take the driving perspective with no attention because it's so familiar. And so I saw it as a kind of defamiliarization of, of of that. Well, we also have Mary's donkey ride, Mary using the donkey mm -hmm. as her vehicle of transportation. Right. So there, the, there is the analogy with that of the cars, and then the cars visually resonate with the Christmas decorations in the city, and they expand the uh, human uh, environment animal, uh, rural situation relation to mm. maybe the built, the humanly icons. built yeah. environment. This winter is lights. city potential. In Finland, winter lights is a very big thing. But it's, it just still seems to me there's something else why she put this here. It was so unnecessary in a funny way in my mind. It's a puzzle. Maybe other people felt it was very necessary. I feel like the uh, often the perspective of the, of the um, her either putting you in the place, putting you in her place as the viewer, um, but also playing with the idea of the perspective of a child in all these different situations because you're a, on a donkey ride, which is like a pony ride here, being led around by a teenager or a grown up, asked to believe in Santa, asked to believe in the Annunciation, the, the sexless pregnancy. And the fact that she, I think, is playing with that, but also 
asking you to also be a part of that, be in the space and not be able to speak back to the characters in the space. Mm -hmm. You know, we're here, but we're not being heard or, you know, we're, we're in the space. So I think being in the car is like one of those things you're, as a kid, you're often put in lots of places where you're, you're just, oh, I'm in the car again. Oh, I took it as like being in the in the booster seat in the back seat in my parents' driveway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I mean this has been we we could talk about this question and then you know maybe we could the wonder of of yeah first impressions of you know childhood. 